Hot diggity damn world one one podcast is back with another episode real quick tease for the third half of the show this week we're going to be looking at uh in in honor of the end of black history month we're looking at black leads black representation in gaming in the games industry with uh wes and zoe and uh one more surprise so stay tuned for that uh Before we dig into all the good meat and potatoes, though, you can and should subscribe and share so that you can make everybody else listen to this nonsense, not just you. You don't have to suffer alone. Stop it. Help others suffer with you and share this with them. Also, uh, down in the links in the show notes, you can and should join our Discord. Quick shout out to our awesome sponsor, Imaginary Authors. More about them just before the break. I am, as always, your host, Roll to the Wall. Joining me this week is the amazing Wes Evans. The one, but somehow not the only. It's a pretty common last name. <laughs> and my lovely, delightful wife, Zoe. Sup, y'all? All right. So, let's uh, let's get right to the meat and taters with, oh my god, video games. Wes, what have you been playing? I am going to be cheating just a little bit. Because I've not had a lot of gaming free time. Because rather than playing video games lately, I have been learning how to make video games in the Godot game engine. Okay. What what are we working on? Tell us about it. So right, I've been doing. Can we play it? I've been doing mostly guided projects. Uh, I sent one video to the group chat. Uh, Obviously, listeners won't be aware of that. It was just a simple little maze game. Uh, right now, I'm working on a 2D shooter, Galaga style. Uh, nothing too complex yet, just kind of learning the ins and outs of the engine. Uh, coding is a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Uh, my background in coding is primarily in Python, which, if you know anything about programming, you know is not the kind of thing you want to do for a video game because it is probably the slowest language that's popular right now. Uh But Godot has its own, uh, I don't know if proprietary is the right word because it's free and open source, but it has its own unique language called GDScript, which is actually inspired by Python. And so if you're going into it, the only real difference is some basic syntax here and there. Any coding nerds who happen to listen to us, you know, all one of them. uh, uh, For example, like the only real major difference I've been able to find, well, one, everything has to be in a declared function, so that's one thing. Uh, two, uh, to define a function, you, it's func instead of def for define. So <laughs> that's about it. That's about the differences that I found go so far. Have you? I'm just curious on the subject. Have you checked out Mark Brown's uh, uh, what is it? Developing series? Not him. Uh, I've been following. Uh, there's a YouTube channel called GD Quest, which I've been following a lot to help me out. And there's one okay. Udemy course. Uh, this seems a little counterintuitive because I chose Godot because it's free. But I knew I wanted to invest at least a little money in it, which is why I bought a Udemy course. Because to me, at least, if I say, all right, well, I spent $15 on this, I, I might as well learn it now. Right. So I was just curious. If you haven't, it's a really interesting watch. But uh, I got to give shout out to Pirate Software, a uh, great Twitch account, great YouTube account. Uh, the algorithm recommended it a year late, but in the back of my head for a long, long time, I've kind of wanted to see if, about going into the industry. Hearing about all the people working in AAA and hating it kind of put that far, far on the back burner. But uh, yeah. he was like, hey, just go out, make games for fun. See if you want to do it for a job. If not, that's okay. You can just make it a hobby, but just go out and learn to do it. And, you know, one year later, that video showed up in my recommended. I watched it, and I decided, you know, let, let's jump in. Right. Um, so, okay. I do have some games, like, to talk about. It's, it's not deep. Well, what you, uh, that's but okay. Yesterday, what do you uh, one person canceled last minute for our D&D session, so instead we played Lethal Company and uh, the Settlers of Catan mod on Tabletop Simulator. How is Lethal Company? It's fun. Uh, I mean, it's not the deepest game. It's also still in early access. I know almost nothing what I'm doing, so <laughs> the guy who was on our team, he was watching the monitor, 
what's the name of the enemy? It's the one that stalks you, but goes into fear mode, but then hunting mode. I, for, I forget what it's called already. Someone, there are Lethal Company out, fa- fans out there yelling at me. It's like, it's, it's the whatever. <laughs> anyway, he told me, look at it, look at it. And so I thought it was like a weeping angel kind of thing where maybe if I looked at it, it wouldn't move. And apparently I triggered it to go into hunting mode and it killed me instantly. <laughs> uh, all right, dear. I, I know what you've been playing, but everybody else doesn't. What have you been playing this this last uh, week or so? It's the same as it was before uh, Darksiders, but I just finished and rolled credits a couple days ago um, on Darksiders 1. Um I'm not going to lie, I was kind of disappointed by the boss fight. Like, I fought smaller enemies that were way more difficult than the boss fight was. Like, I will say at first, um, I wasn't sure how to attack him, but then I totally went and looked up. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? What, are, you know, because I kept dying. And then once you figure out, like, what you're supposed to do, which was more just a timing thing than anything yeah like um it's easy after that like once you understand that and i'm just like that was a lot easier than i thought it was gonna be and so a little anticlimactic um But it was still a good game. Like, I enjoyed the story. I'm looking forward to getting into the second ones. Because this one ends with the rest of the fucking horsemen coming down. And so I'm interested to see where it goes next. Because I know you only get to play as... Fuck, who do you play next? Death? Death Death. is in Dark Sides 2, yeah. And I'm just like... But I know you're only playing as Death. So I'm just like... Where's the other horsemen? Like, this one I understood why you're just playing the one, but I'm like, the end of the game drops the other three, so I'm just like... Well, you see them inbound. You don't necessarily see them all landing the same place either. No, but I'm just... I'm not saying... I'm just curious what they're going to do because, you know, you're by yourself. I'm just curious where the story goes from here, basically. It, right. It feels like, like they hyped it up to where you're going to play as uh, war, not war, because war was in the first one, but like famine, pestilence, and death, and you're just playing as death, basically. Am I understanding that right? Um, It's not that I think I'm going to play all three. It's more like, as far as I know, you don't, as far as I know, you don't really get to interact with like the other ones and so part of me is just like well if they're all there you know do you have to go find them because you didn't land in the same space and i mean granted these games came out forever ago i could easily go look it up but i don't want to because this is my Mm -hmm. first time playing through it and so i just want to know what the hell's going on and so that's just where my brain is now that i have rolled credits on number one and the only thing i know about number two is that you play as the one horseman so yeah I'm you don't want to ruin the fun right so i'm just curious on what the story's going to be about why you're only playing the one right And then I know the third one, you jump to another one. So I'm just like, what's the story they got going that, that, you know, you're really kind of only interacting with one of the horsemen at a time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anything else on your list this week? Uh, For me, like, to play? No, just probably. I might go back and watching you play it yes it hurt my head but like everything in me kind of just wants to fucking play it because nostalgia but um the master chief collection going back and playing number one just because but i do agree with you while we were playing it i'm just like the gameplay in that game is abysmal like yeah it's there's no direction for where the fuck you need to go everything looks the same it's it's got problems and it definitely shows its age, but there's something yeah. to be said for nostalgia. So either that or going and playing Gears 1 by myself because I know that that's not really your bag, but I never played the other Gears of War games. 
I mean, I, I took a fair swing at Gears 1 with you, and it just, mm, I, I, I couldn't get there. When I tried, I, but. Yeah, when I was in high school, my group of friends, we were more Gears fans than we were Halo fans. So I know Halo's the Xbox franchise has survived the longest, partially because, you know, it's the one that got shown the most love outside the 360. But well, it's not just that, but, you know, Halo started first. It had a longer yeah. running start before Gears came along. We were two installments deep, bare minimum, before Gears started. That's true. But I'd also so. argue that, you know, two, a two-game head start would not necessarily equate the dominance Halo's had over Gears if Microsoft had shown Gears the same love going into the Xbox One and Series X that they showed Halo. Although it's arguable that that love is declining for Halo. Especially yeah, with- Infinite and or Five and Infinite didn't do it any favors. Definitely so. not. But, but I, yeah, that's a, that's a thing. I will slightly disagree on the gameplay of Halo 1 being bad. I, I'll say the level design has not aged well. But I'd say all the shooting mechanics. Have. Okay, that's that's what I meant. I yeah. I did not have the shooting the proper... mechanics are fine, but Jesus Christ, if you get in a fucking vehicle, you may as well just throw your controller out the window. Yeah, Halo One's vehicles were rough. The, that's the word I was looking for. Was um. But yeah, the level design was terrible. level design. There you yeah. go. I'd not say the gameplay. The anniversary edition helps it a little bit. But it also, does, but it, not has, much. it also has a problem where, in my opinion, it also makes the screen feel too busy at times, like they overcorrected. Now, it could just See, be I didn't because get that feel, but that's me. It could just be because I didn't grow up with the original Xbox, but the 360. I still prefer the anniversary editions look, but I oh, absolutely God. see why people who grew up with the original do not. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, I I think the anniversary edition is still an improvement in a lot of departments, but when the the foundation that it's built on is not great, you're you're still going to have fucking problems. So, now that said, I'll I'll jump in here with uh with what I've been playing because we're we're kind of leading into that anyways is I rolled credits playing through uh the anniversary edition of Halo 1. And I still stand by the fact that Halo 1 is a trash game. Uh, Like, like, like was just discussed. The, the level design is fucking awful. Uh, The moment you get into a vehicle, like I said, I just wanted to fucking hurl my controller out, you know, through a wall. Um, But the, the story's okay. The anniversary edition takes the story from like a seven to a seven, five with the addition of like the, The terminals that have the little flashback scene things going on, those are kind of fucking neat, but they're very, you know, spread out, not enough to make a real significant impact in the storytelling, but it's there. It adds a little more context, a little more flavor, and I appreciated that. Um, The uh, Other than that, I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that it it was a three-way conflict and one of the two you know, one of those parties didn't even know about it, the other one. Uh, it, that, that's the, the big thing that takes it from being a completely bullshit average story to at least having something of interest or substance there. Um, but yeah, the, and oh my God, what a waste of a fucking finale. Just drive in a kind of straight line for about seven minutes with the worst mechanic of the game, which is driving, and there's no fucking action in it. I'm just, ugh. Yeah, you you dropped the ball in the finale big time. That said, we fired up uh, Halo 2 Anniversary Edition, Zoe and I, and uh, we we started playing through that campaign co-op, and my God, as much as the... As much as the anniversary edition of Halo 1 got a a big visual and, you know, moderate, minor uh, audio overhaul, 2 was just leaps and bounds. Like, good God. You couldn't have gone back and done that for the first? 
I mean, granted, you can't fix the story, or at this point, at this point, apparently the fucking mechanics that needed fixing. But still, well, this th- this was oh, it was so much better. I think part of the reason why the visual overhaul wasn't nearly as significant is because there was one console generation between the original Halo and Halo Anniversary, but there were two console generations between. Halo 2 and Halo 2 Anniversary. Because Halo 1 Anniversary was originally released on the 360. Yeah. Halo 2 came out for the Xbox One. Or the for Anniversary. No, version. the first Halo Anniversary wasn't 360. Yes, it was. That was part of the... Are you sure? I swear that was part of the Master Chief Collection. 100%. It came out in 2011. Okay. I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's backwards in my head, but that's okay. So, but yeah. It, 2 has been much more enjoyable. I also like the fact that with two, you can do the uh, the whole, you know, insta swap between the original and the the anniversary edition yeah. thing. But you can also do it in the middle of the cutscenes. Oh yeah, and Jesus, what a huge fucking difference in the audio. The audio got such an enormous overhaul from the original to the anniversary and two. Yeah, no, um, we were playing the one part where you know you're the arbiter and you're like flying in freaking banshees and it's got this like hard rock like music going and then you switch to the old one and it's damn near silent i'm like you know how boring that's got to be considering you're not even doing something the entirety Mm. of while you're flying this banshee And so the music, you know, just kind of fills up some of the dead time because, like, if you're not actively shooting, you're kind of just chilling and, like, rocking out to this song until something else shows up. And so I'm just like, I don't know what they were thinking originally when they did, too, but, like, they were just fucking Mm. up with the music. Yeah. Um, Um, Speaking of Arbiter, can we all agree Keith David is daddy? (laughs) <laughs> Sweet Jesus. Uh, <laughs> now I want to go watch some red versus blue. But uh other than that, uh Zoe and I did actually crack into some co op Left for Dead too for fun. That was a good time. That was lots a good of time. zombie killings. All right, Zoe. Um, did you play Zoe? No, it was no wait, Zoe was in the first one. It's Rush yeah. in the second one. Yeah. Second one has Rochelle and Coach. Yes. I play so. Rochelle. Um, I mean, I mean, look at me. Was I going to pick anybody else? I mean, <laughs> I have the option to play a black female character, and that does not come up often, which is what we're going to talk about when we get to our deep dive. But, you know, that's not the point right now. <laughs> uh, other than that, I've been bouncing in and out of some prime remaster just in the background for shits and giggles uh i'm i'm actually pushing right on the very end of old school musical which so funny story uh, a while back uh super rare put out a physical of which game was it i want to say it was dandara which will come up in the third half too but they also, uh, and I, I didn't get a chance to snap it up before it was sold out, but they had they had some of them uh, still available in the three packs of, like, the, the three games that all came, or came they released at the same time. Um, and so I bought the three pack, and then LeGru bought the other two off of me because I didn't have any particular interest in them. And one of the other two was actually old school musical. And I looked at Old School Musical originally when I was looking at it. I'm like, yeah, this does nothing for me. Jesus Christ, fix your marketing because the game's great. And I'm kicking myself now for not having held the physical for Old School Musical as well. But I caught it on sale on the eShop for like three bucks. And so I snapped it up and I've been plotting my way through that. And like I said, I'm I'm actually right at the very end of it. And it's funny as hell. Um, the, it's like if Weird Al made a video game parody rhythm game, um, like all the, all the worlds, all the stages are spoofs and parodies of other video games. Most of them very old school. Like one of them was Iron Snail. It's a spoof of fucking Metal Slug. 
Uh, there's uh, Wind of the Savage instead of Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah, all, all kinds of goofy shit like that. Uh, the the music, which you know is obviously going to be the the focal point here, is you you can pick up the hints of the themes of the games that they're spoofing and parody, uh, parodying. Jesus Christ, that's an awful word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like a thousand but, percent, it is. But the music is great. It's a great time. It's it's all chip tuny goodness. Um, well worth checking out if you find it on uh, on a sale or even at full price. It's not bad. Um, I, I do think it's maybe just a touch expensive at full price for what's there, but not by much. It's it's a reasonably decent sized game um, for a rhythm game. And God bless the story is actually pretty decent. But more importantly, it's fucking hilarious. The writing is great. And let, let me tell you, it, it stands on a very short list of rhythm games with great story stuff happening. Like, I, I would put it up there, not quite to, but close with uh, Just Shapes and Beats in terms of story and writing. Just Shapes and Beats, I think, definitely takes the cake just because, one, they did their entire story with no text, no dialogue, it was all just animation and music, and it was magnificent. Um, but and that's that's a real high bar to clear. But old school musical does pretty damn good, and Jesus, I have been laughing my way through it the whole time. Uh, and I, I think another thing that works really well here is that the the story doesn't stop for the songs for the for the gameplay um like as you're playing through the through the songs there are little bits where it it the music is still going but the input stops and it throws you up you know some text to move the story forward because the story is happening while you're playing the songs and like you can see it all happening in the background a lot like uh bit trip as the series did um but this one is much easier to follow the action happening on screen in the background while still being able to pay attention enough to play successfully. Whereas Bit Trip is so very visually and skill demanding that it's hard to take in both the gameplay and the visual storytelling in the background at the same time. So kudos there. I think. I think I might put Bit Trip over Old School Musical as well, just for the fact, though, that even though it doesn't get that balance right, the story they are telling is so good and it is so well done and conceptualized that it puts it a tier above, but like just just a hair. So, but all three of them are in very close company with each other. It's it's good company to be in. You should definitely check it out. Um, a little bit of vampire survivors here and there, just, you know, because it's vampire survivors. And I've been playing a terrible fucking mobile phone game, but I keep playing it. I've I've tapered off. Uh, it, it's not so obsessive at this point. That wore off and everything has slowed down. But I've been playing Lumber Inc. And you can download it and see what the hell I've been up to if you want to. But it's it's a pretty standard, fair, stock mobile you know, idle game. We want to squeeze as much money out. Is of that a is that possible. a cookie clicker like by any chance, for lack of a better way? Because um, there's a game called Egg Inc. that would fall under that, where like you tap or click or whatever, and you get more chickens that can lay eggs for you. Kinda. It's basically like running a a sawmill factory. So, um. I will say I've I've thrown a couple of dollars at it, but nothing like grotesque. Uh, the the biggest one that actually makes it reasonable is yeah, you know what though I as terrible as it is I still enjoy it for whatever god godforsaken reason. But I threw the ten bucks at it to shut the ads off, like completely off. There's so, another way to make sure you never see ads. It's called not playing that game. <laughs> <laughs> you could also just turn off your internet connection too. Then yeah, it can feed but, you ads. Yeah, but you see, 
the other way. There were just... some other perks that came with it, but I'm like, you know what? I can I can do a bunch of things without having to, you know, be force fed ads for the perks. I'm like a one off shot of ten bucks and I can sit here and enjoy it in peace and quiet without the awful ads. Honestly, so. it's one of the reasons, and I know it's super popular, and I feel like everyone's playing it, is why I play Monopoly Go. I have never gotten, like, an, at least an outside, like, game ad. Like, of course, they're like, hey, you know, buy this thing, like, in the game. And oh, I don't yeah. mind, you know, I don't mind that, but, like, I don't get ads. And yeah, it's they one all of get the things that, that shit. It's one of the things that keeps me playing it. And also because, you know, monotony, and it's just kind of like, oh, I got time to kill, might as well, you know, kind of game. And it's kind of perfect for that. Yeah. So, I, I feel like everybody's allowed, you know, the, the the occasional guilty pleasure. This is apparently one of mine. So, but that's um, that's most up. of what I've been playing. I do want to add in something because you asked what was I going to be playing. Um, I saw when I saw Logan yesterday. Uh, he told me about Pal World, which essentially, I guess the nickname uh-huh. for that game has become Pokemon with guns. And we yeah. started talking that, like, for a while, apparently, it even got, like, you know, Nintendo tried to get mad at it because it was using not actual Pokemon, but, like, close enough that you knew what they were doing. And basically, they're like, you do not own the right to a yellow mouse-looking creature with a lightning bolt. So it's not, Nintendo it's not, hasn't chased down Pal World specifically, but they did shut down somebody's mod that they made for Pal World. Right. A big part of where that misconception... What was the mod? Oh, it, it was, was a Pokemon. fucking Pokemon mod. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's big, what it was. They they basically modded it to reskin it with actual Pokemon. Yeah. A big and part Nintendo of where... Nintendo said no. A bit, another big part of where the misconception that Nintendo was going after them comes from is they did release a public statement that was basically something along the lines of, we are looking into if we need to perform any kind of legal action. And then they've stayed silent ever since. At least on... You can't official. really do anything just because something looks like something you're doing i mean as long as like you keep anything that is like legal ip like you know you can't have your even though you know let's say their yellow character doesn't look like pikachu but if you've got it going pika pika like you can't you know you can't argue that but i'm like if you don't have a single like actual piece of their ip other than characters that look similar you can't really do anything yeah you can, depending on how some things are made, but that's a whole, that, that's a lot of, like, in the weeds stuff. Right. So, I have not been playing it, but Gigi has been playing it, and I've been watching her. It's a lot closer to Ark with Pokemon than it is Pokemon with guns, if that makes any sense. It was, I'm gonna I take understood a guess what if, you meant by Ark. I, I don't. Uh, it's Ark's another game, but I figured that... I figured you didn't have the reference point. Yeah. So, uh, Ark's the one where it's like dinosaurs and crafting. And I know you've seen you some trailers like for it. And it's made by the most incompetent developer team of any studio out there. I have started learning game development for about two to three weeks, and I am better than that entire team combined. The people that made Ark or the Arc. people that made Pal World? Ark. Pal World okay. are also not that experienced, but so far from what I can tell, they don't have to make a 300 plus gigabyte game just because every single update must add to the files with no compression, no file replacement whatsoever. Uh, gross. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that pretty well wraps up games of the week. Um, let's uh, let's take a minute. Shout out our awesome sponsor, Imaginary Authors, helping you up your scent game with awesome fragrances for guys, gals, and non-binary pals. My go-to, always a city on fire. Memoirs of a trespasser, sneaking real, real close though. Like that one a lot. Uh, also. 
just recently checked out one of their newer ones, Bull's Blood. I'm a big fan. Zoe, not as much, but you know what? There's something for every taste. And uh, beyond that, make sure you, they, they do more than just, just the wearable fragrances. There's the candles, the soaps. Go check them out. I've got the City on Fire soap, and oh, I get so clean. Uh, it smells so good. So check them out. Imaginary authors link in the show notes down below. Make sure you uh, hit that link and go get yourself some smell good stuff because it helps you and it helps us. So with all that said, let's jump to the break and we're back with the third half of the show this week. We're taking a dive down the warp pipe and to, uh, to cap off black history month, which will have just ended yesterday when this goes up, uh, we're looking at black representation in gaming and the gaming industry. So uh, we lost Wes somewhere between the first half and the third half, but we did find an Eddie. And back is also the lovely life, Zoe. So let's uh, let's dive in. Where do we want to start? Because Zoe, actually, you know what? I'm, I'm going to let you do the heavy lifting on this because this, this was... This was yours. So, um, yeah, no, uh, I'm actually really excited. Uh, most of the time you do these, I either am not here or I'm somewhere in the background because I don't have a whole lot of, um, gamer knowledge. And, you know, with this month being black history month and kind of re getting back into gaming now that I have an Xbox to play, just realizing, you know, where are the black people in my games? Um, so let's, I would say, start off there. Um, just talking about what kind of representation we see in video games as far as um, black characters. And, you know, where do we mostly see them? Um, and things like that. So I will pass it off to one of you. Um, as far as black representation in video games, where have you seen it? How have you seen it? Um, you know, what types of characters um, do they play? Uh, Larry, you want me to go run down some history? or I, I, I got a couple we can bounce off of. I was going to say, one, you're probably more prone to see it in indie gaming just because... Cause. Ooh, that's a weird feedback. Uh, sorry. Uh, indie gaming has a more, I think, at least accessible and subsequently diverse uh, crowd of people in it, um, working in it and leading in it. Uh, I would say off the top of my head, there's actually the one coming up that I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. What is it? Kenzu? Eddie, yeah. you know what I'm talking? Yeah. Kenzu Girls looks like fucking Kenzu, I think. Is, yeah. is that uh which one is that? Is that the like Black Panther esque it, one? Yeah, that's the one. Mm -hmm. Um the 2D platformer. Yeah. That's that's coming up here shortly, and I'm absolutely looking forward to that. Um, but going backwards in the indie space, uh Dandara is another one that was actually done by a Brazilian studio and is based off of more like South American mythology lore. Um, it's really cool too. Like it's a super neat game. Um, just you it, mentioning that game, I want to make a clarification mm -hmm. that we strictly here are talking about black people with it being Black History Month and not just people of color. There's oh, I know. Difference. Okay, I know. I'm like Dandara is a person of color, but she is not black. Mm. So I just um, I just wanted to make sure that we were on this the same page here. Yeah, that's wait. Uh, walks the line a little bit. That's a whole other thing. Um, you just you get more of it there. I will say too. I think another thing that lends more black characters in indie games as opposed to like big trip a budget uh and developed games is and it's it's not as difficult as it used to be but uh the the retro game visual 
is easier to do that with just because you're working in a, a flat 2D pixel art style versus when you're 3D rendering the technology, the, the graphics technology that they use to try and render black characters is requires a lot more to get right because the way that light reacts with actual like black skin and black skin tone. And so you can't liter you can't just do a simple color swap in terms of coding and visual design either. Not to mention, and I know Zoe, you've you heard uh, we listened to this one, the uh, the the hair issue as well. Um, there was somebody who put a lot of time into creating the uh, the open source Afro hair library specifically for uh, artists and uh, visual design or graphic designers uh, in animation and games to use to better and more accurately represent the full scope of black hair uh, in all of its forms and styles as well. Um, I do want to add on to that. So you said, you know, it's, you know, more work, you know, it doesn't really, you know, that's not how things are done. And, it, and not to you specifically for having said that, it's where I want to push back because I'm like, okay, yeah, it's more work doesn't mean you shouldn't do the work just because it's harder or um, I made the comparison to somebody when I was talking about this and I said it's like some of my friends that have gone to beauty school right and they learn how to do hair and all this other shit but rarely and I think I've only had one friend who said that this happened they don't learn how to do black hair and I'm like why Mm -hmm. Yes, it's more difficult. Yes, it's completely different. And you have to do things differently to manage black hair. But the fact is, like, if I want to get my hair done, I have to do a deep fucking search or ask people that live in my area where I can find a salon to get my hair done. Because, you know, it's not done everywhere. I can't just go into a salon and be like, hey, I'd like my hair done. And I told someone, I was like, they don't have to do, like braids or learn how to crochet braid or like any anything like that but i feel like very basic wash condition style done like that should be something simple enough that you know how to do and so with the whole you know where technology is and like part of me is like i get that like technology is where it is but part of me wants to question what are they doing to fix that because yes technology is difficult and working with that and it and the person that we know that put the afro library together i'm like that was a black person seeing you know a gap and then filling it why is it up to us to make sure we're repre you know represented like that shouldn't completely fall on us to do oh i'm not saying it does and i'm not saying it's an excuse i'm just saying that this is a factual thing is that one is it's not a simple case of you can color swap and there's a, a black person on the screen without it being like incredibly wrong compared to anybody else that's being portrayed on the screen or you know generated in a digital space just because like i said the the visual physics mechanics the the light mechanics are not the same and so it takes additional and it's it was you got to figure out your your baseline of can we make a person on a screen first now how do we make it right now how do we make it work for everybody and so it's just it's a it's a step-by-step -step process it's why if you look at like old pixar movies no people of color they couldn't work oh, out. I know. That's like my, and, my and response going was further not... back. It's why like Toy Story really didn't even have people in it because the difference between getting the lighting physics right against a in an inanimate object, aka toys, compared to getting it right with like actual human toned skin wasn't even there yet. So it's it's just you you kind of no, worked like, your way out. I don't out want you to think little. that my response was to mm -hmm. you in general. It was just me adding in my thought. And I completely understand that. Like, technology is technology. But mm -hmm. I think my, like, more to the point thing with that is kind of a problem in and of itself, which is society so much is developed 
with like white people in mind and making sure things are there for white people. Like a lot of stuff when it's being brought up or being invented, like it's not, everybody is not being thought of, you know, like no, no one thought to include that. And we are now, which is good. And I'm not saying, like I said, this is not in response to you, like, you know, or yeah. anything. It's just kind of in general. So it just kind of makes you think like, you know, and I get, you know, where games came from in the past of video games, and I get it. Like, it wasn't a thing. I mean, look at just society. Like, black people weren't included in, like, anything. And so I get that. But my thing is, if Pixar now can take the time, you know, and I'm not saying Pixar is, like, a bad company, but, like, f follow me here. Took the time to figure out how to render and design Merida's hair in Brave, which had not been done before, because they had to focus on individual strands of mm -hmm. her hair. I'm just like, what's up with the gaming industry? And like, why are we not, you know, like, it's possible you have to put in the work. There's, there's extra steps to being able to do that in making a game versus making a movie, too. Because when you, if you break it down with games... You have to be able to create an engine that can do all that work essentially on the fly versus a movie where everything can be very specifically animated. It's all under a very controlled set of circumstances. So you need to have a an engine that can actually do that in real time in response to anything, you know, that's being input. So, but that's, that's, like I said, it's, I, I'm not saying it's an excuse either. It's just a, a an order of operations and progression in developing technology is you make one thing and then you try and apply it to as many things as possible. And then you find out what it can and can't do. And then you work on the things that it can't do. And then you repeat the process over and over. And so, you know, you start with, can we can we build a, a an engine that can render humans? Cool. Now let's try and put all the different kinds of humans in there that we can find, and then where do we have problems? What's causing those problems? Now let's fix those problems so that we can do that too. And then it's the next thing, and it just repeats the process over and over. It's it's programming at a base level essentially. All right, Eddie, let's get you in here. <laughs> you got to check your mic there, dear. Something is way up. But, okay. Eddie, go. So, um, I think we got to look at the history uh, of char black characters in games. Um, one of the most well-known, recognizable black characters uh, was Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson punch up. That was the only black character Nintendo actually had until Ken Griffey Jr. for Super Nintendo. Um, when it came to the Sega Master System or uh, and everything, Double Dragon uh, was a big one, but black characters in there were the enemies. Um, mm -hmm. We did Sega didn't get a black character until um, Teresa Rage. For the Sega Genesis, which was um, Adam Hunter. Um, and then the Sega CD happened, and you had Night Trap where the commander was black. Um, and I think they had the Star Wars games. I think Billy D. Williams was in a in, in something. Um, oh, really? so, uh, I think he was. But when it came to like black characters in games, um, I'm not even including females because there really wasn't no female representation of characters in a lot of games and stuff. Um, for like a black character, Final Fight from Capcom was was one, but most of their characters were a mixed race in there. So it didn't really representation of black characters didn't really become something. Uh, literally until almost 2010, until the indie scene really hit, because black characters weren't seen as main characters. They were seen as side characters or enemies um, in it. 
So if you if you look at it, compared to like Barlow, you know, he wasn't in Street Fighter one. He was only in Street Fighter two, and they didn't get another black character to Street Fighter three Third Strike. Um, I say, and, and, uh, I was gonna say Street Fighter had a handful because, like you said, Balrog, DJ. Was well, another. yeah, DJ. Yeah, I forgot about mm-hmm. DJ because that's Super Street Fighter. Um, but they didn't get like a black female character then to like Street of Ra- Street Fighter Three stuff. So, um, and it, it was it's it's kind of amazing to see because of course, um, Gears of War, you have da- I believe Dom is the name. Yes, uh, and I believe Dom is. As far as I know, I think he's mixed, but I think he's like black and Hispanic. I think. Yeah. Um. No, Coltrane. Cole. I'm sorry. Uh. Cole was the black one in in the game. Uh. And then DJ in uh years four and five was another black character. But like, if we really wanted black representation and black characters. You had to get like a sports game, like a license. I was just game. gonna say Bo or, Jackson, Tecmo Super Bowl, right? Or you had, to, or you literally had to get a wrestling game and or something with a, a customized your own character, um, yeah. because that was the only black representation that you were going to get in the games. Of course, we have Barrett and Final Fantasy VII, but you don't get to play him. You still play as Cloud, um, and. I, I know you mentioned earlier, like with retro games coming, who made them? Definitely in Japan. Uh, I'm saying could, retro style indie games. Oh, I, well, I'm thinking. I'm just thinking retro oh, games yeah. in general. Back in the past, because a lot of our develop, a lot of our games come from Japan. Um, yep. You know, and a lot of Americans, if they were making the games, they were all on PC, and you didn't see any black representation on there. It didn't. It really didn't take, like I said, to 2010 for us to even get black representation. You want a, a black female lead? Alawak 2 is probably the most recognizable one. Like, what other female black lead do you play in this? You could say uh, Resident Evil 5 uh, with... Uh, What's her name? Um, on it, I had to look it up. Um, but that's like the only other person. You didn't really get that many characters um, and stuff. Like, Prey was a Native American. Um, prototype 2, the lead yeah, was, 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 was a black was black. Man. Yeah. Um, Spawn, but he's a licensed character in our thing. It's like, you... It's kind of hard to talk about black representation. Mafia with uh with with CJ, I think that's his name. Or oh, I have to look up Mafia Mafia Three. Um, and that was a game based on Italians. You know, we were like literally seen as a certain stereotype. Rockstar made their money off of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. I was gonna say me. I was like Grand Theft Auto, and I was just like, yeah, I'm not surprised that a lead of Grand Theft Auto is black. Like it just sadly you know fits the stereotype so right and oh. and that was and that was developed by a majority white team you mm-hmm. know even though they did go to Compton to get pictures and study study the art form so they could represent it right but we didn't really get anything like that but the suffering is a has a male black uh lead and stuff for like a survival horror game we didn't mm-hmm. you know we got stuff uh, we got stuff here and there and that was experimental. We didn't get anything that was actually mainline or very or you know portray black people in a good light and stuff. Yeah, there are different protagonists of uh, black characters, but we didn't we don't have the Hellblade Swan of Sacrifice. Or we don't have the Detroit become well Detroit become human. I shouldn't say that because that character is also black. Um, but we don't have that kind of narrative storytelling about black characters and things that they go through. We don't have anything of that. Um, um the most recent that I can even think of would be uh, the Miles Morales game that came out, and you know, it was such a big deal. And part of me feels like 
if the movies hadn't even gone well, like that wouldn't be a thing. And um, it's actually kind of funny that uh, one of my kids for Black History Month, I had them do a like research paper and it had to be, you know, a person or something that like, you know, affected the black community. And one of them picked Miles Morales showing up. And the whole idea from that came fun, like funny enough from a show called Community. And Donald Glover's character is in a Spider-Man suit. Someone tells him, you know, Spider-Man's not black. And he was just like, well, he is today. And someone literally took that and was like, well, I'm going to make a black Spider-Man. And if you think about it, that wasn't even that long. It took that long just to get a black Spider-Man, you know? And so in, it's because, and, you know, there's this, you know, thing when I talk about, because I find myself in the cosplay community a lot, like stuff online. I'm not a cosplayer, but I find myself on that side of the internet a lot. And they were talking about, um, you know, characters now becoming black. How is my child supposed to relate to this black character? And it's like, I don't know. I've been black my whole life and I've had to relate to white characters all the time. You know, like when I was a kid, I didn't have a Disney princess. There was no Disney princess that looked mm -hmm. like me. When Princess and the Frog came out, I was like, holy shit. And now granted, I think I was I think I was a teenager at that time. Yeah, I'm I'm young for the people listening. I'm 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 very much on the young end. Um and um I'm on the younger end, and so, um, yeah, when that came out, I was like, oh my god, I could see myself, you know, as, and I wish I had it as a kid, because, you know, when you're that old, you can't really go find costumes and shit for yourself, but, like, I wish I could have dressed up like a princess. I couldn't be anything. I remember going to the store with, you know, my dad looking for Barbies, and it took a while just to get a black Barbie. Like, mm -hmm. it, it was... It was insane, and uh, it just, it it's amazing that, like you said, like, up until, like, the 2010s, I'm like, it's taking this long, and I'm just like, fuck, it's 2024, like, I want to see a fucking Black Master Chief, like, not necessarily in that franchise, but I want a character that's that big, and they're black, because we've got, we got black people playing characters, like, I think at least twice now the voice of Kratos has been a black guy. Mr. Fred Jones. Yeah. You have Captain Keys in Halo. Uh I do like that at least on the show, Captain Keys is black. And I'm like, ha! <laughs> He's black, bitches. Because I did know he was played by a black guy. So it was kind of awesome that in the show he is played by a black person. But so, yeah. you know, in so also like what Eddie was saying, you know, black people have been side characters or an option that you could play, but rarely like the main person. Like we're playing Left 4 Dead mm -hmm. and fuck, there are two, you know, black characters that are in there. But I'm like, you know, it's also first person. So it's not like you really get to see your character or like walking around, which goes back to kind of like the whole technology part of it a little bit, because you don't really have to focus on that a whole lot when you don't see the character. And it doesn't matter if you see the other character down the hallway, like, you know, it's kind of whatever at that point. And the game is, like, it's dark in area, so you can kind of fudge lighting a little bit. Kind of the same thing with Gears. Gears is a darker game, so you don't really have to focus on how is, you know, a bright light going to hit their uh, their skin as much as you would in, like, a different game. Something like if you... Something like Breath of the Wild, where you're running out around in the daylight, you know, and having to figure out how that's going to hit skin. I find it funny we're talking about how light is hitting skin, and I'm looking at my face, and Raw, I'm looking at your face, and you're you're just, like, shiny and, like, gone in the light of your computer. It's kind of funny. I've got it, like, yeah. No, I know, no, I know why it's there. I just think it's funny. I'm like, we're literally showing you right now the difference of light hitting skin. I'm like, when light hits mm -hmm. his skin, it just washes out, you know? Like, it just looks different. And I understand that, but the fact is, you know, who's working on it? Who's trying to push that, you know? And I, because I feel like so often when these, especially these big AAA games come out, I'm just like, where's me? 
Why do I got to be the indie game? Why do I got to be the side game? You know, why can't I have a major company pushing myself to the front? Because I'm like, so, we're definitely a part of the industry. Like, I think of, go, go ahead. The, the thing about it is definitely with white males um, being the protagonist is that white males are the default in games. Um, because it's safer uh, for some for some people guarantee sales and depending on what the genre is, and they feel like they don't want to feel they don't want to not say be accused but feel like they um they not they don't want to offend other races and religions and stuff like that by putting uh, a culture or putting people in a certain kind of lifestyle that they don't fully know or comprehend. And sometimes this comes from the higher ups um, than it does the developer team. Sometimes, you know, things changes and maybe they present the story. Maybe there have been directors of different races and different creeds who have talked about they want to put a game out with this kind of character. And the first time, first thing that higher us would say, um, you know, even though the pitch could be a good seller, anything, they're gonna, they, the thing is gonna be like, is it gonna make us money, or they're gonna, they're just gonna pass on it because they know that, yeah, you could, that sounds good and all gravy and rice, but if this game doesn't sell, why would we want to take a risk of? It? And I think it's sometimes the higher ups still have that stereotypical um, idea is, uh, of just using a white character because it's safe, it's going to generate money for them, uh, and sometimes it's, you know, it still doesn't work out that way. They, they could have a cast that's just full straight white, and sometimes that game may not sell, but if an indie game with a cast of different characters, um, different genders, um, and stuff. If they see those numbers go up, they're going to be puzzled on why this white male default character game didn't sell, but this other game does. You know, it usually I think the higher ups who are making these business decisions to allow developers to make games, they are not. Then they're not informed. They're not educated about different cultures. You know, they they're thinking of business. They're not thinking about representation or inclusion. They're not thinking about any of that. They're thinking about business, and that is backfiring on them. It's not. It's literally. It's not working for them. So now it's coming to a point where if y'all really, if, if the higher ups really want to see a change, um. I don't want to say see a change in business, but if they really want to see something that is going to be positive and something that is going to show them that it's going to change, uh, they got they need to be educated. They need to learn about Black culture and Native American culture and Asian culture, Irish culture. They they need to learn these things because if they're not learning it. And everything, and they just stay, stick to the old, just views on white male protagonists. Games would never grow, so that company would never grow because they're using the same old formula, and sometimes that same old formula is not working. You can say whatever uh -huh. you want to say about Nintendo with their formulas and stuff, but they have a history of games, and their stuff has has changed. And the cities, you uh -huh. know. I want to I want to add to that because you're talking about like kn knowing a culture and I'm just like it is possible to get a focus group to make sure I'm like um I know Disney did it when they did Moana mm -hmm. they went and were like hey we want to make sure we are showing this Polynesian culture correctly how can we do that you know and so I'm just like one it would it would be as and I don't want to say I don't want to minimalize you know the kind of work that goes into that but I'm like it would be as simple as that if you want to make sure you are portraying someone's culture correctly go find someone or find a group of people to look at your game and um you know say that but also my thing is not everything necessarily with you know people of color 
has to necessarily include their culture. And, like, I swear to God, before people come at me in, like, comments or fucking whatever, um, you know, I don't even necessarily need to see my culture in a game. I just want to see people that look like me in a game. Like, earlier I said I want a black Master Chief. You could have easily made Master Chief black. Now, granted, you never see Master Chief, which technically means in the show he could have been a black dude. I'm mm-hmm. just I'm just throwing that out there. None of us I knew what he looked like. I think that may have actually been canonized in the books, though. Okay. And so I'm like, he could have easily been black. Because we don't need necessarily black coat. This is a thing that takes place like hundreds of years in the future in space. Okay, mm-hmm. like I don't, I don't need black culture if he's just some military dude. Because you got to think when you watch the show, like Soren exists. He could have easily been Master Chief. You know, like and Bad so it's not necessarily even that. Like I always want to see my culture. Now, granted, when I see my culture, it is fabulous. Okay. But one, anytime they usually do, it's very stereotypical and it freaking sucks. But part of me is like, especially with the whole Miles Morales thing, you know how much money they would have made on a freaking Black Panther video game? You know how much money you could make off of that? It is coming. Uh, that, if you had done it when the first Black Panther came out, you were still kind of in dicey territory because it was very 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 early in the mcu that for the most part the industry learned to stop doing movie tie-in games yeah uh, because they were historically pretty fucking awful and so they got away from that i wasn't saying like redo the movie because like the miles morales game is not part of the movie oh i know i'm just saying side story and downtime okay like when you see T'Challa, he's already the Black Panther. What the fuck was he doing before his daddy died, okay? Like, what was he off doing? Because his dad was king, but he was Black Panther. So I'm like, and then at the beginning of the Black Panther movie anyways, he's on a mission to go get Nakia. And I'm just like, clearly he's doing other shit, okay? Yeah, that's so still you could have made a movie about him just doing Black Panther shit or made a game about him doing Black Panther. So many Spider-Man games exist that have nothing to do with Spider-Man movies, okay? It is possible to make a movie game that is not based on the movie. The thing about it is that it's, it's, it becomes the time of the release, you know, and definitely uh, depending on the people who hold the license, like Marvel and stuff, they would actually tell the developer, because they have the right of the control, and tell the developer, okay, we want oh, every movie that you're working is, I want it to be, uh, if we're going to give you this property and stuff, we want it to be connected in some way close to the movie. Because we know that if we if we can get the movie out and the game out, we know that that's good merchandising uh, mm-hmm. and good money for us. Um, and everything because I'm like, even though we we're talking about Miles Morales, Spider Man has had a ton of games before he had a lot of the movies, and the qualities of those games are hit and miss. You know, the only reason why we got a Miles Morales uh, is because Insomniac did it. Activision had tons of times to do a Miles Morales because Miles Morales, Morales, his comic books were already out before Insomniac even got it. But it wasn't a theme for Activision, you know. It, it it took Insomniac, and it took the and when Marvel and Insomniac and Sony seeing the numbers and the fan base and how the quality came out, that's when you know we started seeing Marvel trust more with Insomniac to do a Miles Morales game. Marvel had Marvel had a tons of times to, to have Activision do it because Activision had the license for a long time, but the quality of those games weren't turning out the way that they hoped for. Even Nintendo, when they had Ultimate Alliance three, they could Marvel could have gave Nintendo Miles Morales, but because it was different Marvel characters, they were just like just stick with Spider Man. No, sometimes Marvel Marvel has to gets to make those decisions for the developers. Mm-hmm. 
you said something earlier that like I want to touch on and it's it's a bigger problem like than even outside the gaming industry you said like you know people don't want to take that leap to put you know a main black protagonist because mm-hmm. they're worried it won't sell and I'm just like shit that's a systemic issue that like oh no you know characters not white I'm not interested in this game but part of me also thinks think about the numbers and I'm going to mention Black Panther again but just just because it's the most recent thing I can think of like the numbers that that movie put out honestly a lot of it because of the black community I saw the first Black Panther myself three times in the movie theater three times mm-hmm. you know and so could you imagine you know you put out this bomb ass looking game and the protagonist is black could you imagine how the black gaming community would react to something like that. You know? And then sometimes you got to do that shit, and I know that companies don't want to do it, but operate at a loss. You got to take a fucking leap and try it. It could fail. It could very well fucking fail. But if you don't try, you won't know. It happened to the same thing with women. They didn't really want to put women in on the box art of games. Um, but Tomb Raider proved that. Look, let me tell you, the time that it took Tomb Raider to get popular and be loved as a character, it took longer. Well, I, I should say this. The love that of uh, the Goose got in Untitled Goose Gay was almost like an overnight success of love. It took Laura Croft a long time to get lo- that same kind of love and everything. Like if you look at if you look at Tomb Raider Remaster and you see a lot of people reactions to it, they're loving their game. They ha- they they love Tomb they love Laura Croft, but it took her a long time to get that kind of uh, acceptance and everything. People trusted a goose over. Uh, a fake goose over a fake female character, I can say. Well, I know we have to wrap up here. Um, so we're going to go around and just last minute thoughts. And uh, we're all because you haven't spoken in a while. I'm going to toss it to you first. What are your last minute thoughts wrapping this up? Last minute thoughts are that it's, I, I'm going to steal a a quote from Philip DeFranco that comes up often is that, and I'm going to paraphrase actually, because I I can't say it for certain like he does on the subject of technology, but I do think that in this moment, it is the worst it will ever be. Like it, it's only going to keep moving in the right direction. Now, as to how fast it happens, that's a a bigger question and some of what we've talked about. But, you know, I I do think that it is at its worst state that it will ever be from now to beyond. Um, The the other is, like I said, just a a weird. Now, I'm going to nix that point, but I will say, too. Be be mindful because I would stipulate more than just saying there should be more and you know more representation or, or even better representation is make sure that it is being handled with care because you could have great representation, but if it's a terrible game or a terrible story you're not doing anything any favors at that point. You know, I I, would, I look at the, the boom in popularity that Miles Morales got from Into the Spider-Verse, but keeping in mind that a lot of that also has to do with, at least in part, it was a very well-written story. Agreed. So... Representation for representation's sake isn't always great. No, you can backpedal doing that shit. Oh, yeah, just look at the Human Torch. I mean, that whole movie was shit, but there was no reason to specifically just make the Human Torch black. And it it pissed me off, and I am black, okay? Like, I'm just like, why? 
either both of them or none of them. Like I would have been okay. All right, Eddie. I will say with something like that, just a, a, a piece to ponder on is that his, his character's race isn't really pertinent in any major way. And so that gives the, the directors and the producers liberty to go, well, who do we think is best for the part of this character and their personality? And so, you know, for whatever that director's vision was from one, you know, the first run of Fantastic Four to the second, you know, where that change happened, there's something to be said for that too. And at that point, I can go into why I still didn't like it. There's a different piece about it, but we're, like I said, we need to wrap up, but that can be Mm -hmm. a conversation for another time. I have tons of things to say about, you know, black media, but, you know, we're trying to wrap things up, not start a new conversation. So Eddie, what you got? (laughs) So I, I just, I just want to say, and I won't try to be long. Um, go look up the developers and go look up the teams who have made games put black characters in it. Like, go look up the team who made Mafia 3. Go look at um, even some of these indie games. Um, the Endless Runner one with the hip, with the one uh, black developer. I forgot the key. Yeah. Uh, like, go check out his stuff and what he thinks. Um, like, Look, check out Street Fighter Three Third Strike in that in the fighting team and see how if you can find information about Elena, that's her name and stuff. Because I think if you if you kind of want to know about why black characters are in video games and why you don't see a lot of them, check out the developers' teams, like hear their stories and stuff. And then if you are, you know, interested in seeing black characters and you know, black characters create games. Go check out Kickstarter. Starter. Go check out games and stuff. Put out some blogs or essays. Like, get get your voice out to be heard, so that people could recognize that you do want more of this. Because if not, we're going to keep continue to get the same stuff, and we'll continue to get a black character here or there. You know, so um, that's what I had to say. I happy. happy no, it happy was good. February. <laughs> Like if you want, um, but yeah, like, like, yeah, but try to try to get your Ariel voice Knights heard. never yeah. yield. Is that the one you were thinking of? Yes, yes. Um, I wanted so, to get the title out there for reference before we shut this down. Um, so where I'm gonna leave off is basically, you know, honestly, if I could, you know, speak to the people, you know, running these game companies. I get that doing this might mean a fail, you know, like Eddie was saying, it happened with Laura Croft, but that didn't stop them from continuing to push Laura Croft until eventually people loved her. I don't know if that love came after Anna Jo, Anna Lena Jolie became Laura Croft. I don't know. No, it was there um, before, which is why that movie happened the way it did. Okay. Um, but the only way for things to change is for people to decide that they're going to change it, to do it, you know, because much like I do agree with you, Eddie, yes, people need to get their voices out there, but ultimately it's going to be whoever runs these companies that make that decision and they need to take that risk, make that leap. Um, Don't get me wrong. I know companies don't want to lose money, but you know, it could pay off in the long run. It may not pay off right now, but, you know, got to think long term. And so I just want them, you know, got to take a leap of faith. There you go. Miles Morales quote for you. Got to take it's a leap of faith. All right. So um, I don't normally do the sign off and I don't know if you want to add anything wrong. So I'm going to sign off happen with you. You go ahead and sign us off there, man. All right, so a quick thank you to our awesome sponsor, Imaginary Authors. Thank you to Eddie and Zoe for joining for uh, this week. And thank you to everyone that tuned in and listened. Make sure just, you know, once again, subscribe and share. 
share is the most important part because even if you hate listening to us, you can make somebody else listen to us so you don't have to suffer alone. And that's important. That's how trauma bonding happens, kids. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. Have I... All right. Say good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. And we'll see you next time on War One One Podcast, everybody. Bye. Peace.